fact, I'm drinking the blood of my enemies and the cheese of those who wronged me. That tastes like the cheese of those who wronged me. Did you just see that? Holy. Wow. Hello, dear doodlebugs. It's Mary. It's Game of Vlogs, where I freak out about the most recent episode of Game of Thrones season six, the season finale. Winter has come. And this time, this is a very special vlog. This time I will be including spoilers. So if uh, you're not into spoilers at all, um, then I would recommend there's a mm, something on the screen you can click. There's links in the description below to take you to something else. Roll the dice, see what it is, or you know, you could, you've done internet before, you can figure this out. With that, you've had your warning, you've had your fun, and now we'll spoil this in three, two... All right, we've made it. The finale. Oh my goodness. It is so warm in here. I just, I still think that's LA. My voice is shot from VidCon, so apologies. It's gonna be a little bit more sexy than before, and I know nobody wants that, but this is what you're stuck with. These are the hands you're dealt. This is the season finale, so a lot of stuff went down. We got Sir Loris on trial, undoing everything that Pride Parade has done. We've got Marjorie discovering her X-Men powers are the ability to predict major plot points just before they happen but not in enough time to change it. And the High Sparrow, believe it or not, can get closer to the Seven Gods. And the pagans dance and rejoice. Lady Olena becomes our only hope of Dorne actually being interesting. Melisandre gets fired. Walder Frey learns that a girl is not a baker. A girl is a butcher. Sam and Gilly go to the library. Mm -hmm. Bran continues to be addicted to vision quests. Sansa is totally done with Littlefinger, but like, she wants to know, is he talking about her or anything? And everybody loves Jon Snow, which is coming up next after kids stab the darndest things. Like Grand Meisters. And Cersei always makes me want to drink a big old glass of wine. Get it, girl. You won that throne unfairly and obliquely. And Daenerys finally takes that cruise she's been talking about all these years. Okay, let's talk about King's Landing first off and that whole first scene because it was so mwah, delicious. This episode was directed by Miguel Sapochnik. I don't know if I said that right, but he also directed the previous episode and you can really see there's this cinematic production value in there. From the beginning of this episode to the point where everything goes boom, you are feeling that tension, very brooding, and just, wow, whoa, whoa, what a way to open the episode up with. Whoa, I did not put together that Cersei would become aware of the metric buttload of wildfire stored under King's Landing and use that to her advantage. I was honestly very concerned as to how she was gonna get out of this one. And she didn't even have to leave the house, but she did get dressed and ready and she looked Amazing. So Cersei has managed to orchestrate the 9-11 of King's Landing and take out all her enemies pretty much. But there's the unforeseen side effect, at least on her end, of Tommen killing himself. And that's kind of the tragedy of Cersei. And I know people don't like her, especially you go back and watch the older episodes. She's responsible for a whole bunch of horrible things. And somehow they've managed to make me forget that she insisted Sansa's innocent wolf lady be killed, even though she didn't do anything. Yeah, you can like torture and put to death like all these people and cause a lot of pain and suffering with humans. But when you kill a fictional animal in a fantasy TV series, that is a very hard thing to forgive. And I gotta say, I've come to appreciate Cersei and what she does. She's a very fascinating, well-rounded character. And now she's without children and with all the power. And I know empty nest syndrome can make people extra productive. Jamie and Cersei are now without any children and that's probably going to be a strain on their relationship, which is very ironic knowing that Cersei and Jamie Lannister are responsible for a young boy going out the window by the name of Bran Stark and setting off this entire saga. Honestly, I'm very shocked Marjorie got taken out. But I should have known the moment she's not showing cleavage, she's off the show. I thought Lady Elena was the one we were gonna be worrying about. Turns out though, she's in Dorne 
which could be, it could make Dorne interesting. Is it me or was there some meta commentary in Lady Elena's dialogue when she's roasting the sand snakes? Did they just go over Twitter comments and put that in the script? And Varys is very smart in going to Dorne. I, I thought he was going to King's Landing, should have known. He's going to Dorne to support our overlord and savior, Daenerys. Of course you're gonna go to Dorne if you're gonna be behind the mother of dragons, which he is in the last scene of this episode, even though he was just in Dorne, he was now, he's on the ship, he was in Dorne, he's on the ship. He's like, he's racking up his frequent sailing miles. Moral of the story is never trust children. Sam and Gilly, Sam and Gilly go to the library. Yay. I mean, it's good to check in on them and establish that storyline and where they're at. It's also good to establish this big, giant old library with all the information of the world in it. That's never gonna burn down, right? If I can, say one thing about this show is it never follows any actual events in history. Don't put your eggs in one basket or I'll, I'll eat cheese. I'm eating cheese because I started drinking wine in honor of Cersei becoming queen. And when I drink wine, I might eat cheese. Gangsta. Meanwhile, in the Riverlands, Lord Walter Frey is celebrating his victory in the Tully's castle, which is now his. It's all going nice and good for him until he finds a finger in his pie. And if there is one thing that can ruin a day is going out for a nice meal and finding some part of another person in it. Arya Stark is getting a little scary, which makes sense psychologically speaking. She's experienced a heck of a lot of trauma as a child. So it's not really a surprise that she's gotten violent tendencies and is wearing other people's faces. Arya Stark has gone Ed Gein on us. I don't know how much longer it's gonna be cute. And when or if she's ever reunited with her family, uh, how are they gonna accept her? And is she gonna accept that life? She's kind of, she's kind of gone feral. The very interesting thing with Arya is she's made it all the way back to Westeros and the first thing she does is put on a new face, swing by the Riverlands and kill Walder Frey. That's the first thing she does. She could have gone up to Winterfell. Are we gonna see Arya prioritizing her kill list over returning to her family? But it is cool seeing Walder Frey taken out of the game and knowing that Edmure is safe. Edmure appears to be in the dungeons. They do address the Blackfish. We still haven't seen a body. So unless you show us a body, I think that Blackfish is still out there. Also didn't technically see Marjorie die, so Fire Marjorie zombie versus the Night King. Are we gonna get some fire zombies in there? Come on. This wine says it's a good idea. Also, we wrap up Bran and his Uncle Benjen heads back off into the forest beyond the wall because, you know, the wall, it's magic. Uncle Benjen can't get down there, but maybe we'll see him again or maybe we won't. And Bran goes back into his visions to finally confirm what many of us have all been speculating all along. So in the flashback of young Ned Stark rescuing his sister, Ned finds her after she, she's just given birth. Ned promises his sister, yes, I will protect your baby. Now, what do we, what do we know? Okay, we know that this baby is Jon Snow. So Jon Snow's mother is Lyanna Stark. That makes Jon Ned's nephew, not his son. Ned claimed that Jon Snow was his bastard son, which he fathered with a random woman, some wench when he was off at war as men do. You know, that's a thing guys do. I don't know, I don't get it. Of course, this revelation totally makes sense. If you read into Ned Stark's character, he's a very honest man and he follows the rules almost to a fault. So Jon's mother is Lyanna Stark and we can only assume that his father is Rhaegar Targaryen. Rhaegar Targaryen is dead. We have never seen him in this series. He is the older brother of Daenerys. And so Jon Snow would be the nephew of Daenerys Targaryen. Now do you still wanna see them make out? The other big question is, was Lyanna raped by Rhaegar or was she in love with Rhaegar Targaryen, which at that point in history would be almost like a Romeo and Juliet kind of story because her family, the Starks, were at that time warring and rebelling against the Targaryen king. And this is why Ned Stark would lie about baby Jon Snow because baby Jon Snow is the blood of his enemies 
and his friend's enemies. And his friends would want all the Targaryens killed. In fact, when his friends took over and Robert Baratheon won the crown, there was a sacking of King's Landing that resulted in many Targaryens being wiped out and necessitating Daenerys to flee. So John is part Stark and part Targaryen, part snow and part fire, song of fire and ice, what's happening? He's just got a little bit of everything. People love him, everybody loves Jon Snow. We've seen this pattern many times in the show where people underestimate and even despise Jon Snow only to love him and realize how awesome he is at leading. Ugh. But he's also emotional as we've seen in the previous episode with the battle where he he just runs out onto the battlefield to save his brother, even though he knows that this is a strategic act to get him to come out. Jon Snow is rash and reactive and acts with his heart and emotions. And I do feel he made a very emotional decision in banishing Melisandre. Now that the battle's settled, there's a bit of security. Sir Davos has come forth and brought some charges against Melisandre and is demanding her death, which I understand why, but I also feel like banishing Melisandre is a mistake. Melisandre has made mistakes in the past, but she did bring Jon back from the dead and could prove to be a very important tool in the future. So perhaps Jon banishing her has been yet another rash and emotional decision, which is totally opposite of Sansa, who is now much more pragmatic and not trusting of anyone, even her own step brother, as she knows him to be. I, all I can say is just examine Sansa's past and it totally makes sense. Everyone she's trusted has either lied to her or just fallen through and fallen off the face of the earth. Even her own father who betrothed her to a boy that turned out to be a sociopath. There's nothing, there's nothing that this girl can rely on. Why would she even rely on her own family? Of course she's gonna be paranoid. And of of course, she's gonna assess all of her options. Now all the Lords of the North have pledged their allegiance to John, which is driving a wedge between him and his sister Sansa, which might be exasperated by Littlefinger. That's something he's gonna take advantage of. So we leave Winterfell with Jon Snow being declared King of the North because we need a gender balance and with a queen on dragons and a queen in the south, we gotta get some men up there. We need more men in power. Speaking of the dragon queen, we now, oh my gosh, we finally have Daenerys sailing west with Varys behind her. How did he go from Dorne to the ship right away? I don't get it. Oh my God, it's finally happening. It's finally getting interesting again. There's a lot of complaints about how Daenerys and her storyline has gotten boring and weird, and it has. I feel like they've been stalling on it. But at this point, watching this episode, I can't help but reminisce on where she's come from. She grew up as a refugee on the run, always at risk of being killed. She was molested by her brother, sold to a barbarian king who raped her, had to totally immerse herself into a brand new culture, rebuild herself as a queen, lost the baby, lost the man she learned to love, became a fallen queen, led a rebellion against slavery, uprooted a system, almost lost that. She's gone through a lot of things. I mean, I don't approve of Dario, but after I got out of a really long and serious relationship that broke my heart, psh, yeah, I made some weird choices. But it is also very nice to see her break up with Dario, finally. And it's because Tyrion talked her into it. We got a very refreshing scene of Daenerys opening up to Tyrion and having real talk with him and seeing her as a scared young woman that she's always been. And we're reminded of why this series is so awesome because everybody has a reason and a story and you look past the curtains of villainy and you just see a scared, horrified, intimidated person who is insecure and doesn't know what's gonna happen. So ends season six of Game of Thrones wrapping up a few plot lines, leaving some holes open. It looks like this is all leading to three major players, Jon Snow, Daenerys Targaryen, Cersei Lannister. Are we gonna get Jon versus Cersei? Are we gonna get Cersei versus Daenerys? Are we gonna get Jon versus Daenerys? Are there gonna be some weird alliances? Is everybody finally gonna get together and just like go after the Night King and defend life and all of existence? Cause that sounds like the reasonable thing to do. 
I don't know. There's a lot of open-ended questions and the death pool artwork for this episode that needs to happen. So I'm going to be posting a video next Monday that's going to be a bonus game of vlogs where we can just kind of wrap up and discuss those loose ends and hopefully get you that death pool artwork if our winner replies with a comment of a drawing or a painting. So if you have any theories, if you have any ideas or questions about characters, plot lines, potential things that are happening, conspiracy theories. Let's get weird. Leave those comments below. Nothing's too strange to discuss. And before we get to the death pool, my favorite scene of the episode, I'm going to say the wildfire scene. The direction and the craftsmanship of building that tension was fantastic. It was just the most gripping way to start an episode. My favorite character of the episode it might be controversial. I'm gonna say Cersei Lannister. You inspire me to drink. Like I said earlier, Cersei is a very easy person to dislike. I find her also very admirable in certain ways. She's grown up in a man's world and has made her way to a position of power. And in one moment, she managed to take out all of her enemies and anybody who could at least slightly threaten her at that point. She is getting her sweet revenge and boy has she suffered to get to where she's at now. So kudos to you, Queen Cersei. Please think of me favorably and spare me and my family. You scare me. And my least favorite character in this episode, Cersei Lannister. But no one say that. We're gonna whisper because I'm afraid of her power. She's managed to take out some awesome characters like Marjorie, who I'm a fan of, as well as some innocent extras. The rest in peace man crushed under a bell. The things that make me hate Cersei, I think are only gonna escalate now that the children are gone and that's not gonna be something to hold her back. She is off the leash. I love her and I hate her. And with that, let's go to the Game of Thrones death pool. Last week's winner did not leave a comment on what to be drawn. So this week's winner, if you are the winner, be sure to come back and uh, comment on this video. So we had a couple of close calls and runners up. Mipsprit Cross guessed that Cersei is gonna burn King's Landing with wildfire, which she did but predicted that Cersei was the one that was gonna get it. Close, but no cigar. Alexis Rico guessed that John would execute the Red Woman, Melisandre, after Sir Davos would make him. And while that scene got close to that result, John had some sympathy. All right, this was a big episode. A lot of bloodshed in this one. Meister Pycelle is gone. Uh, Lancel Lannister, gone. Loras Tyrell, Marjorie Tyrell. Mace Tyrell, dead. High Sparrow, Praise of Seven, is gone. Walder Frey is also gone. Septimella is having a grand old time with the mountain. She's not quite dead yet. And Tommen is gone. And our death pool winner is Julia Justice, who took some time off from fighting crime and commented saying, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say Tommen will die because all the Lannister kids will die according to the witch lady in the woods from the flashback. The prophecy is real. So, Julia Justice, if you wanna take an evening off from fighting crime and leave a comment below as to anything you wanna see me draw or paint, do that and I will feature it in next week's video. I could draw anything, it could be Game of Thrones related or not, whatever. And on that note, dear Doodlebugs, um, I'm bummed. I'm bummed the season's over, but yeah, let's discuss it next week. So any thoughts you have on the season, the characters, where it's going, where it's been, leave a comment below and we'll talk about it next week. And I want to say a big thank you to everybody who came out at VidCon and said hi. And uh, more than a few of you said that you've watched the Game of Vlogs series on this channel, which makes me feel happy. I like making these videos uh, now that the season's wrapped up. Maybe we could find another show or movie nights to do. I might move it from Monday just for scheduling purposes because I like having Sundays to go to the farmer's market and chill. But if you have any thoughts on that, 
comment below. I'd love to hear your feedback on that and anything else you want to see on this channel. I try to do the weekly videos for those of you who are new here, and I do Friday Doodle Diary. I've got June in a nutshell coming up, as well as some VidCon footage from the event this year. Um, all that good stuff. Anyway, thank you, dear Doodlebugs, for watching, and until next time, you stay away from the pointy end of the stick and dive into a big old glass of victory.